As an authorized Kirby Service Center, we appreciate your dedication to providing quality service to our valued Kirby customers. While the Kirby is built to last decades, normal maintenance is required and occasional issues arise. This video has been produced to provide you with all the information needed to maintain and repair the Kirby system. Please follow the instructions closely when servicing the Generation Series cleaners as they contain important specifications that are critical to the performance of the product, along with the component parts, materials, and supplies in all Kirby models. Products have been designed, tested, and approved by Kirby Engineering to maintain optimum performance, quality, and reliability. The instructions in this video are applicable for the Generation Series through Avalier Series, service manuals, exploded diagrams, and of course, our team members are standing by to answer any questions. Be sure to use only genuine Kirby parts and supplies when performing repairs and service work. First, be sure to check the power supply and verify that there's power to the outlet. Next, check the power cord. If the cord's defective, replace the power cord. Verify that the mini emptor and nozzle are connected to the unit. Check the nozzle and make sure that the attachment lug is on and is activating the power switch. This lug right here must be in place to activate the power switch interlock. Remove the screws which secure the power cord strain relief. In the Generation Series, there were three designs to secure the strain relief to the cleaner. Each one is similar in that one or two screws are used. Remove the screw at the side of the machine that holds the cord cover. To remove the cord cover, you'll need to push the cover forward towards the nozzle and pull it out at the top. Next, remove the scuff plate, then remove the screw above the neutral drive pedal. Insert a flathead screwdriver in this opening and pry up. To release the tabs at the front of the scuff plate, push backward with both thumbs ahead of the handle pivot spring assembly and lift off. Take care to not break the two clips located at the front of the scuff plate during removal or installation. To remove the cover shell, remove the screws on either side of the foot pedal and the two screws from the front of the cover shell. Then lift and pull back. Remove the foot pedal from the transmission. Carefully pry up on the foot pedal at the transmission hinge points. It may be necessary to pry the foot switch actuator rod towards the transmission to allow the rod to raise up. Once the rod is up, slide the foot pedal off the actuator rod. To remove the transmission, depress the neutral drive pedal on the drive side. Remove the three transmission mounting screws located here and here leave this screw in place. Raise the power switch actuator rod up. Then, as you drop the transmission down through the opening in the base assembly, carefully remove the drive belt. To remove the slide bracket casting, disconnect the jumper wire. To do so, cut the wire tie located over the plastic insulator slide back and disconnect. Then remove the two screws located at the back of the slide bracket casting. The next two screws to remove will be located at the top of the fan case. Remove the slide bracket casting then lift and remove your upper headlight lead wire. To remove the actuator rod, we recommend removal once the switch is disassembled from the motor. This would also include reinstallation of the actuator rod. To remove the right brush holder, remove this screw. Carefully rotate the brush holder downward, away from the screw, and pull the wire off the power switch. Disconnect the left brush lead wire and remove the headlight jumper lead wire. Remove the power switch mounting screw. 
To remove the power switch, pry back at the bearing plate. When reinstalling, verify that you have eight terminals on your field coil and make sure they are straight. They must lock into the power switch when installed to the motor housing. When reinstalling the power switch, use this edge of the motor housing as a guide for the edge of the power switch. The speed actuators need to pass through the opening in the fan case and base pan. Press down against the motor housing and push forward to lock the terminals into the power switch. Next, install the power switch mounting screw. It is very important that you use a Torx screwdriver for this step and set the screwdriver to four to six inch pounds of torque. Install the left brush lead wire. This will go into the top terminal located at the back of the power switch. Install the right brush lead wire onto the lower terminal of the power switch. If these brush lead wires are connected to the wrong terminals, the motor will be running in the opposite direction. It is very important to have the left brush lead wire plugged into the top terminal and your right brush lead wire into the bottom terminal. When installing the brush holder, it is very important to have this tab aligned with this slot located in the motor housing. Push the carbon brush in the holder and rest it against the armature. Engage the tab at the bottom of the brush holder in the slot in the motor housing and rotate the brush in towards the top to engage it. Install the right brush lead mounting screw. Again, it's very important that this screw be tightened with a Torx screwdriver. The torque setting for this screw is four to six inch pounds. To install the actuator rod, we recommend this be done when the switch is independent of the motor. Plug the cord into the power switch. Install the bag mini emptor assembly to the exhaust port. Install the nozzle to the fan case. To start the motor, lift on the actuator rod and keep your hands clear of any moving parts to the motor. Push in the actuator rod to start the motor. And if the motor now operates, refer to section 30 for complete reassembly instructions. Verify that the brush is not sticking in the holder. It should slide in smoothly and release smoothly. If the brush is stuck in the cartridge, it will be necessary to replace the complete brush holder cartridge assembly. Either brush lead wire could be defective and cause a motor not to run. Inspect the brush lead wire and replace if necessary. If the motor still does not operate, it may be necessary to replace the complete motor assembly, the field and or armature. To remove the motor assembly, remove the exhaust duct screw. To remove the exhaust duct, pry out the opening located at the top and lift from the bottom with your finger. To remove the motor assembly from the base pan, remove the rear motor mount screws. Next, remove the front motor mount screws that are in the wells behind the fan case. From the base casting, lift and pull back. For further disassembly of the motor, remove the brush holder assemblies, the brush lead wires, and the power switch. When removing the fan, insert an 11 32nd open end wrench on the flat spots of the armature shaft, located just ahead of the rear bearing. Insert the wrench onto the flat section of the armature shaft ahead of the rear bearing. Insert the fan locking pin into the hole on the motor pulley. Rotate the pulley clockwise as the pulley has left-hand threads, then remove. Next, remove the metal fan washer, the fan, mylar washer. Finally, remove the spacer seal assembly. To remove the motor sprocket gear, remove the snap ring located at the back of the armature shaft. Use a pair of snap ring pliers to do so. Only spread the clip as far as necessary to remove it. Carefully pry the motor sprocket rearward using a flat blade screwdriver. To remove the bearing plate, remove the four bearing plate screws. 
Then, slide it off the armature shaft. Carefully pull the armature out of the motor housing. In the bearing pocket of the motor housing is located a flat washer, tolerance ring, a finger spring. Be careful not to lose these. A normal armature should appear like this. An armature with raised or burned commutator bars or damaged wiring would be a probable cause for an armature to fail. Replace if you encounter any of these conditions. Remove the field coil from the motor housing. Remove these two screws. Slide the field out by pressing on it with your thumbs in this location. Also within the motor housing is a metal sleeve located behind the field. Assure this part is reassembled when the field is installed. Inspect for any damaged or burnt wires. Also verify that you do have eight terminals in place. If there is a broken terminal or any damaged or burnt wires, replace the field coil. A blown fuse will cause a motor not to run. A continuity check will determine if the fuse is blown. To replace this, the entire left carbon brush lead will need to be replaced. If the motor only runs on one speed, check the nozzle and make sure that the lug is intact. This operates the power switch and will engage it on low speed. Another problem that could cause one speed would be if the lug was broken off the suction blower end of the hose. A defective power switch could also cause a motor to only run on one speed. Inspect the speed actuators and verify they're both in place. Also, the power switch could have an internal problem, and in both cases, the entire power switch should be replaced. A defective field coil could also cause a motor to only run on one speed. Replacement of the field coil is described in Section 1. If the motor continues to run with the nozzle or mini emptor removed, the power switch is defective. Replace the power switch as described in Section 1. If the motor runs briefly and stops, or the motor runs intermittently, the power cord could be defective or loose at the switch. Check the power cord for brakes and replace if necessary. Check the power cord where it plugs into the switch. It should fit snugly, and if it does not, the power switch is probably cracked at the bucket. Located right in this area here, this would cause a cord to fit loose into the power switch. Another defect with the power switch that could cause the motor to run briefly or intermittently would be an internal defect. In either case, the power switch should be replaced as described in Section 1. Inspect the brush to be sure it slides in and out of the holder assembly properly. It should not stick or drag, and if it does, the whole brush holder assembly must be replaced. If during repairs there is an excessive amount of arcing coming from the armature at the brushes, or if there's an electrical smell, check to be sure the motor does not bind. It could have a broken or blocked fan blade. Rotate the fan pulley to ensure that it is not bound. If the fan is blocked, see Section 10 for fan and fan case disassembly. Another cause of armature and carbon brushes sparking would be if your brush was stuck in the holder. Check the brush and make sure it slides in and out of the holder. Replacement is described in Section 1. A defective armature could also cause sparking at the brushes. Inspect the armature commutator bars for raised bars or any scoring. Replacement of the armature is described in Section 1. If the motor continues to spark from the armature and brushes after replacing the field coil, then the field coil is defective. Replace the field coil as described in Section 1. In rare cases, the power switch could also cause excessive arcing at the armature and brushes. Replacement of the power switch is described in Section 1. If the motor vibrates, inspect the fan blades. Be sure it's not chipped, worn, or has any missing blades. If required, fan replacement is covered in Section 10. The fan pulley itself could cause a motor vibration problem if it is out of round or wobbles while spinning the motor. Replace the fan pulley. Replacement of the fan pulley is described in Section 1. A defective motor bearing could cause a motor to vibrate. To replace the front bearing, remove the bearing plate as described in Section 1. Flip the bearing plate over, and on the back side it contains a snap ring. Remove the snap ring with a pair of snap ring pliers. Flip the bearing plate back over. 
gently tap the bearing out with a motor pulley and hammer. To replace the front bearing, insert the bearing into the bearing plate. Reinstall the snap ring and make sure the snap ring is all the way seated in the bearing plate pocket. If the rear bearing requires replacement, remove the armature as described in section 1. Install the bearing puller between the armature and commutator bars and the rear bearing and tighten the bolt. As you tighten the bolt on the bearing puller, it will pull the bearing off the shaft. When reinstalling the bearing, take care and only apply pressure to the inner ring of the bearing and do not apply pressure to the outside of the bearing as you are tapping on, as it will damage the bearing. A defective field coil or armature could also cause a motor to run hot. Inspect the armature commutator bars and look for any scoring or raised bars. Also inspect the wiring for any damage on a field coil. Inspect the wiring for any damage and look for any signs of burning or arcing. Replacement of both items is described in section 1 of the video. If you are experiencing motor bearing noise, one or both bearings may need to be replaced. One indication for a bad bearing would be roughness felt spinning the inner ring of the front bearing. With your finger, feel for roughness or sticking. Replacement of the front bearing is described in section 6. Also, you can inspect the rear bearing for roughness by spinning the bearing on the shaft replacement of the rear bearing, as described in section 6. If the motor makes a squealing noise on wind-down, the most likely cause would be a lack of grease on the bearing plate eyelet. Remove the fan as described in section 1 using an 11 seconds open-end box wrench and a fan locking pin. Wipe any debris away from the bearing plate eyelet surface with a clean rag. Then apply a thin visible layer of T159S grease to the bearing plate eyelet. Only a thin film is required. Do not apply an excessive amount of grease in this area. Reinstall the fan assembly as described in section 1. If the problem is a clicking sound from the motor area, you may have a foreign object in the fan chamber. Rotate the fan to make sure it spins okay. Having excess sealant hanging down inside the fan case and resting on the fan blade will cause a ticking noise as the fan goes by the debris. To inspect the fan chamber, remove the fan case it will require removal of these five screws. To break the seal free between the fan case and the base, insert a flat blade screwdriver between the base pan and the fan case at this point. Pry back on the screwdriver to release the fan case from the base pan. After removing, it will be necessary to remove any sealant that is left on the mating surfaces on the fan case and base assembly. Scrape off any remaining sealant with a knife or any similar tool and all the sealants must be removed to have a proper seal. When reinstalling the sealant to the fan case, it is very important that you do not use an excessive amount of sealant as is shown here. It eventually wears away and it will rest on the fan blade and it will cause a ticking noise as it rubs on the fan during motor operation. When reinstalling the fan case to the base assembly, Kirby Engineering recommends either the use of sealabrine sealant, available in a cartridge that fits a caulking gun, or Dow Corning 732 RTV, available in a cartridge or a hand-squeezable tube. These are the only recommended adhesives for this application. When applying the adhesive, it is very important that it is applied all the way around the outside edge of the fan case, as shown, to prevent air leaks. Install the five fan case mounting screws. Torque each of the five screws to 24 to 32 inch pounds. Using a rag, wipe any excess sealant that may have oozed out between the fan case and the base pan. Another cause for clicking noise from the motor area could be a damaged commutator bar on the armature. Examine and replace the armature as described in section one. A defective motor bearing could also cause a clicking noise from the motor area. Examine the front and rear bearings, as described in Section 6. One other source of a clicking motor could be if the motor was wired backwards at the power switch. The left brush lead wire loops underneath the motor and should come up and plug into the top terminal of the power switch. The motor housing will be marked with a B 
right above the brush holder, and there will be a corresponding B either at the back of the power switch or the side of the power switch. The right brush holder will have an O or an A stamped on the motor housing above the brush. The brush lead wire goes to the bottom terminal on the power switch and will be marked with an O or an A. If this is wired backwards, the armature will be spinning in the opposite direction and you will get the brushes making a clicking noise on the commutator bars of the armature. The B is located right here. The O is right here on the power switch. If upon inspecting the machine, you find that there is a lot of dirt inside your base pan area and your transmission gear and your motor sprocket gear are worn and full of dirt, possible causes could be a leaking motor seal or a torn horn gasket. Inspect for the conditions as follows. To check for a pinched motor seal, Remove the slide bracket casting as described in section one and examine the motor seal. It's the rubber gasket located between the bearing plate and the base pan assembly of the machine. Inspect the motor seal all the way around as it should not be pinched or twisted and there should not be an air gap between the base pan and the bearing plate. Another way to examine it would be to shine a light in the front of the fan case and look for any light escaping out the back of the motor between the base pan and the bearing plate. If you suspect the motor seal is pinched, you will have to remove the motor as described in section one. When replacing the new motor seal, make sure it fits in the channel all the way around the outer edge of the bearing plate. Remove the O-ring horn adapter using a flat blade screwdriver between the gasket and base pan. Twist the blade while prying the adapter upward. Note, do not tamper with the rivets. Remove all debris from the exhaust horn of base pan. Check horn adapter rivets for excessive movement. Replace if necessary. Installing a new horn adapter gasket. Place O-ring horn adapter assembly into base pan, keeping assembly centered in horn. Apply force evenly by hand to top off assembly until it snaps into place. If the headlight does not work, it will be necessary to change the LED board. ESD protection is required so components are not damaged during the installation from electrostatic exposure. Check all connections prior to replacement, such as the jumper wire and headlight harness wire, and connections into the motor. Check field coil correct resistance and inspect for discolored areas of the coil body. If LED does not work, replacement will be required. Remove headlight cap assembly from unit. Remove HD light cap from slide bracket assembly by removing these two screws. Remove these three screws from the pivot latch and two screws from the HD light frame bracket. Remove pivot plate, HD light pivot casting along with the bushing. Remove HD light frame bracket from casting. Remove LED board from these two retaining hooks. Install new LED board. Take care to note the installation slots for proper alignment and slightly spread the end LEDs for proper fit into alignment bracket. Assure retaining hooks are securely in place to hold LED board. Next, reinstall the HD light frame bracket into the casting trim strip. Note, proper alignment of the lead wires in the channel of the HD bracket. Install the two HD light bracket screws. Install the bushing by first wrapping it around the pivot casting, hinge side up. Then insert into casting slot. Install pivot plate, three screws, and route the wires through slide bracket. Assure that the insulator sleeve is through the opening as well as the wires. Install washers on either side, if applicable.
If the transmission has a problem of weak assist in forward and reverse, it could be due to the fact that the tread is worn from the rear wheels. If the tread looks worn or shiny, replace the rear wheels, insert a flat bladed screwdriver in the opening at the back of the wheel, and push down to release the hubcap. To remove the wheel, it will be necessary to remove the snap ring with a pair of snap ring pliers. When replacing the wheel, install with axle spokes facing out and not the flat side. Line up the wheel on the axle and install the snap right on the axle. When installing the hubcap, the hubcap has tabs on the back side. These tabs need to line up with the slots in the wheel. Simply push on the hubcap. Another cause for a transmission of weak assist in forward and reverse could be due to a slide that is sticking. The slide assembly should move back and forth freely. If it does not, it will require removal of the handle pivot assembly. To remove the handle pivot assembly, remove these two screws. Lift the handle pivot assembly from the unit to disassemble the slide. It will require removal of the right side guide block screws, left side guide block screws, and the wedge screw. Remove the slide adjusting wedge. Remove the slide guide blocks and roller bearings as an assembly. Examine the slide components as follows. Inspect the inner surfaces of both guide blocks and look for wear, rust, or pitting. If any part appears abnormally worn, rusted, or pitted, replace it. Examine the slide for wear. If there is any abnormal wear found in this area, replace the slide. Examine the roller bearing cages to make sure that all the roller bearings are in place and that the rollers are not worn or flat spotted. Reassemble the slide components. Assemble as follows. If lubrication is desired, use only WD-40. No oil or grease should be used. This is very important to the operation of the transmission. Install the assembled components onto the slide bracket casting. Next, install the right side guide block screws. This should be torqued down to 25 to 30 inch pounds. As you're tightening down these two screws, apply pressure toward the headlight harness side of the machine to ensure that the guide block is even against the wall of the casting. Tighten both screws. Next, line up the slide and bearing cages by inserting the T147S shim tools. This ensures that everything is lined up properly and at the center of its travel. Next, install the wedge. The flat side of the wedge rests up against the left side of the guide block. Tighten the wedge screw down to 4 inch pounds. Next, Install the left side guide block screws and torque the screws down to 25 to 30 inch pounds and ensure that the slide moves back and forth freely. There should be some resistance to it moving forward and backward. It should not stick or hang up. Reinstall the shim tools to verify that the slide and roller bearings are aligned and at the center of its travel. Again, remove the shim tools when installing the handle pivot assembly Drop it straight down, engage it on the transmission linkage, and do not apply pressure on the linkage forward or backward. Also, do not move the slide back or forth. Install both shim tools to ensure that you still have the slide in the center of its travel. Install the screws for the handle pivot assembly and tighten to 60 inch pounds. Remove the shim tools and test the operation of the slide and handle pivot assembly. The slide should travel back and forth in the slide bracket casting and should not strike the front or back of the casting. It should be centered. If it is not centered, it will be necessary to loosen the black screws again and adjust the slide forward or backward until it is centered. Also, check for proper operation of your neutral drive pedal with the pedal in the neutral position. The overload clutch gear should be separated from the drive bevel gear the gears should not be touching each other with the pedal in neutral. If they are, 
the gears will hit each other and cause a grinding noise. Also, with a pedal in drive, the gears should lock together. This is very important to the transmission operation that they lock together. To work on the neutral drive pedal assembly, remove this screw from the bottom of the transmission. Once the screw has been removed, lift back on the neutral drive pedal assembly and remove. To remove the bracket lever assembly from the neutral drive pedal, lift up and out. Inspect the cam on the neutral drive pedal. The cam should not be split or cracked anywhere. If it is, the whole neutral drive pedal must be replaced. Also inspect the bracket lever assembly. The lever should move freely and it should slide underneath the fold on the bracket freely. Also, inspect the tip of the lever. The tip should not be worn and should be rounded. If the tip is worn, replace the bracket lever assembly. Also, inspect the arm in this area. If the arm is broken or it's bent upward at an angle greater than shown here, the bracket lever assembly needs to be replaced. An internal transmission defect could also cause the transmission to have weak assist in forward or reverse. If such a defect exists, it will require replacement of the complete transmission assembly. To install the neutral drive pedal assembly, depress the pedal on the drive side. Install the bracket lever assembly onto the neutral drive pedal and insert the pedal assembly into the back of the transmission. Install the neutral drive pedal assembly mounting screw. Torque this screw to 12 to 16 inch pounds. If the unit runs away in either forward or reverse, check the operation of your slide as described in step 13 of the video. Also make sure that the filter bag is not overfilled as this would cause the handle to not return to the upright position and cause a machine to stay in reverse. Also, make sure your handle pivot spring assembly has the proper tension it should when the handle is released. It should return to an upright position when tilted back. If the transmission moves in the opposite direction that the handle fork is pushed, the motor has been wired backwards at the power switch. Refer to step 10 of the video for proper brush lead routing. If the unit hops, jumps, skips, or chatters, the first item to check would be the brush roll belt. Verify that the belt is not stretched out. If it is, replace the belt. Inspect the rug plate and make sure that it is clamped on properly and not bent. It should be sealed all along the front and it should be latched properly at the back. If the problem persists, adjust the slide as described in step 13. If there's still a problem after adjusting the slide, replace the transmission. Removal is covered in step one and transmission installation is covered in step 30. If the transmission primary drive belt is too tight, loosen the three transmission base mounting screws and force the transmission to the ratchet side of the machine with a screwdriver. When loosening these three screws, it is not necessary to remove the screws. Insert the screwdriver between the base casting and the transmission and pry the transmission towards the ratchet side of the machine while tightening your three transmission base mounting screws. While still applying pressure with the screwdriver at the transmission and base, tighten the three transmission base mounting screws to 22 to 26 inch pounds. Tighten the front center screw first. If the transmission makes a grinding noise with the pedal in the neutral position, examine the cam on the neutral drive pedal and the bracket lever assembly as described in step 13. Another possible cause for a transmission grinding when the pedal is in neutral would be that the overload clutch does not slide over the drive balls freely. The gear should slide over the drive balls freely. If it does not, either the overload clutch drive balls and axle or all components must be replaced to correct this condition. Another cause for a transmission grinding in neutral could be if the axle is worn where the drive bevel gear rides on the axle. To inspect for this condition, slide the drive bevel gear to the left of where it normally rides and inspect the axle at this location. Wipe off any grease to get a better idea of the condition of the axle. 
If the axle is still shiny, as in this case, all you would need to do is apply a thin film of T160S grease to the axle in this location. Lightly coat the axle, then slide the gear back and forth a couple times to distribute the grease. If the axle had been worn in this area, or the plating was worn off or dull, it would be necessary to replace the complete axle. When replacing the complete axle, also apply the grease in the manner shown. If a squeaking noise comes from the transmission when rolling the unit across the floor with the pedal in neutral and the motor off, it could be due to a lack of lubrication at the tip of the bracket lever assembly and the overload clutch. Remove the neutral drive pedal as described in section 13. Apply a small amount of T160S green grease to the valley of the overload clutch gear where the tip of the bracket lever assembly rides. Also, apply a small dab of grease to the tip of the lever on the bracket lever assembly. If you hear a clicking noise when the unit changes direction, check the slide to be sure it does not strike the slide bracket casting in either forward or reverse. If it does strike the slide casting, adjust the slide assembly as shown in step 13. A missing drive ball from the axle assembly could also cause a clicking noise when the unit changes direction. Check to be sure both drive balls are in place. If one is missing or both are missing, the unit will make a clicking noise or not operate at all. When in the drive mode, replace the drive balls as described in step 13. Also, inspect the wheel hub at the center. The D-shaped opening here should not be rounded out. If it is, replace the wheel. Inspect the end of the axle where the wheel fits to the axle. If the axle is worn, it needs to be replaced. This will cause a loose-fitting wheel and a clicking sound as the unit changes direction. If the unit pulls to the right or to the left, it could be due to rear wheels that are worn unevenly. Examine both wheels, replace if necessary. Check to make sure that the rug plate is properly installed and is not bent. Replace the rug plate if bent. Make sure that the brush roll is installed properly. Both end caps should be set to the same number setting. Inspect the front wheel shaft to be sure it is not bent. If it is bent, it will cause the nozzle to dig into the carpet on one side. The base pan could be bent if the machine was dropped. There could also be a problem with the machining of the fan case or nozzle. To test for this condition, set the unit on a level surface and make sure the nozzle contacts the surface evenly. Lower the nozzle and be sure it touches down on both sides at the same time. Pulling to the right or left could also be caused by a defect in the carpet itself. Test the unit on a different carpet. The brush roll performance indicator light should be a steady green color as the brush roll is spinning. If it is not, repair as follows. Make sure that the brush roll belt is not stretched or broken. If the brush roll does not spin freely, it could be due to a frozen bearing or just dirt in the bearing. Remove the end caps and examine the bearing. Dirt or hair could be caught between the bearing and the end of the brush roll. Clean out the debris with a screwdriver or other suitable tool. Also, make sure the end caps are on the correct end of the brush roll. The BPI light is defective and requires replacement. Remove the nozzle bumper, then remove this screw. Remove the BPI light from the nozzle casting when replacing a BPI light. If you are having a problem with the brush roll belts breaking easily, examine the brush roll. Be sure it does not bind. It should spin freely. If it does bind, try to free up the bearings or replace the brush roll is described in step 22. If the motor is wired backwards, it will cause the brush roll belt to slip off the end of the fan pulley and get caught on the belt lifter hook. Refer to step 10 for proper brush lead wire routing. If the unit does not pick up dirt properly or has little or no suction, check the brush roll belt. Be sure it is not stretched or broken. Replace if either condition exists. Also, Make sure the brush roll is properly adjusted. If the brush roll binds, free up the bearings or replace the brush roll. 
If the fan blade is broken or has worn blades, replace the complete fan assembly as described in Section 1 and Section 30. Examine the filter bag. If there is dirt above the full line on the bag, it will decrease the airflow through the unit. Examine the top adapter and fill tube. If they are clogged, they will need to be cleaned. Remove any debris from inside the mini emptor. Also, remove any debris found inside the horn area or inside the fan chamber itself. Remove any debris that is found inside the nozzle casting. If the motor has been wired backwards, the unit will have no suction. Check the brush lead wire routing, as described in Step 10. When the handle fork is released, it should return to a vertical position. If it does not, it could be due to a bent latch plate or a bent handle pivot assembly. If the latch plate is bent, remove these two screws along with these three screws in the handle and replace the latch plate. Do not attempt to straighten it out. If the handle pivot spring assembly is bent, replace as described in step 13 of the video. If the handle fork falls, make sure the filter bag is not full of dirt and test with the cord off the cord hooks on the handle fork. If the spring is weak on the handle pivot assembly, replace the handle pivot assembly as described in step 13. If the tilt latch lever is broken, replace as follows. Unscrew the tilt latch shaft from both ends and slide the shaft apart. Pick out the broken part and install a new lever. Screw the shaft back together. If the bag top latch is broken, replace as follows. Cut off the old bag top latch with a pair of side cutting pliers. Do not cut the strap on the bag, only cut the latch itself. Remove the broken latch and install a service latch. Install the latch with the Kirby name facing the rear of the bag. The service latch will have a notch cut out at the bottom to allow you to install the latch onto the strap. If the suction blower end of the hose requires replacement, you can apply heat to the inner cuff of the hose in this area shown with a heat gun to soften the cuff. Twist and pull to remove. You can also immerse either end of the hose in hot water until the cuff becomes soft enough to twist and remove. If water or heat is not available, you can place the screwdriver inside and pry away the cuff. Be careful not to damage the hose or the cuff when using the screwdriver method. To assemble the motor, install the screw boss sleeve into the motor housing, if applicable. Then, insert the field coil into the motor housing. The terminals of the field coil should point toward the rear of the motor housing. Insert the screws and nuts. The nuts used in this assembly are locking nuts. If a nut is lost, reassemble using a locking nut. Torque the screws to 16 to 20 inch pounds. Install the new washer. Then, Install the new tolerance ring into the motor housing. The finger should face the rear of the motor. Finally, install the finger spring. The fingers should face the front of the motor housing.
slide the armature into the motor housing. Install the bearing plate over the armature shaft. The bearing plate has a right angle corner. This should be at the lower right corner of the motor as viewed from the front and there are also two tabs that stick out from the back of the bearing plate. These tabs should be lined up with the opening on the side of the motor housing. The bearing plate uses four small diameter head screws to mount to the motor housing. Place the locking nut in the motor housing. Insert the bearing plate screw and torque the screws down to 16 to 20 inch pounds. Install the motor sprocket gear onto the armature shaft with the shoulder facing the outside of the motor and the gear teeth facing the motor housing. Install the snap ring onto the armature, being careful not to stretch the snap ring any farther than is necessary to install the clip. Install the power switch to the motor assembly, making sure that there are eight terminals in place on the field coil and all the terminals are straight rest the power switch up against the motor housing in this area to use it as a guide to avoid bending the terminals on the field. When sliding the power switch on, make sure that the power switch slides behind the tabs located on the bearing plate. Install the power switch mounting screw and torque the screw to 4 to 6 inch pounds. Install the headlight lead wire To install the left brush holder assembly, align this tab with the slot in the motor housing. Located just above the field nut, push the brush in against the armature, insert the tab into the slot and rotate the brush down. Install the screw, torque the screw to 4 to 6 inch pounds. Route the brush lead wire through these slots located in the motor housing and bring the brush lead wire up and plug it into the B terminal on the power switch. Install the right brush lead wire onto the lower terminal of the power switch. The tab on the bottom of the brush holder fits into a slot located in the motor housing. Insert the tab at the bottom of the brush holder into the slot on the motor housing and rotate the brush upward to engage the brush in the motor housing. Install the brush holder mounting screw Torque this screw to 4 to 6 inch pounds. When installing the fan assembly, install a thin visible layer of Kirby Engineering approved T159S grease to the bearing plate eyelet. It is only necessary to apply a thin film of grease in this area. Install the spacer seal assembly. Install the mylar washer. Install the fan. Install the metal washer. And install the pulley. Snug down the fan pulley. Do not over tighten it. Insert an 11 32nd wrench on the rear of the armature, just ahead of the rear bearing, and insert a fan locking tool to tighten the pulley. Prior to installing the motor assembly into the base of the assembly, check the motor seal for damage. If damaged, install a new motor seal. Install a motor assembly into the base pan. Press down on the back of the motor to be sure it is locked into position. Install the motor mount screws. Torque the screw to 22 to 26 inch pounds. Turn the base pan over and install the front motor mount screws in the wells located behind the fan case. Torque the screws to 22 to 26 inch pounds. A loose screw could cause a motor vibration problem. 
If the screw will not tighten, replace the clip on the motor housing. Place the exhaust grill into position in the base pan casting and hold it steady with either a flat bladed screwdriver or a pair of needle nose pliers. Slide the exhaust duct down until it snaps into position. Then install the exhaust duct screw. Install the headlight jumper lead wire into the opening at the power switch indicated here. Make sure that the jumper wire plugs securely into the field terminal and it's not loose. Rotate the slide bracket casting into position and connect the headlight jumper lead wire to the headlight harness. Make sure the connection is tight. Slide the clear plastic tubing over the connection and secure the tubing with a wire tie to the leg of the slide bracket casting. Snip off the excess. It is very important that both headlight lead wires are routed around the outside of the leg of the slide bracket casting. They should not be to the inside of the leg. Install the mounting screws to the rear of the slide bracket casting legs. Torque these screws to 16 to 20 inch pounds. Install the front slide bracket casting mounting screws. These screws pass through the fan case at the front of the unit. Torque these screws to 24 to 32 inch pounds. When replacing an axle assembly, it is important to note that the drive ball recesses are a greater distance on the left side of the axle than they are on the right. When installing the drive balls, it will be helpful to apply a small dab of grease in the drive ball recesses to help hold the balls in position during assembly. From the left side of the axle, install the overload clutch gear onto the axle. Be sure that it slides over the drive balls freely. Next, install the drive bevel gear. The teeth on the drive bevel gear must face the overload clutch gear. Install the washer. Install the bushing. The bushing has a washer on the intersection. The washer should face the center of the axle assembly. Install the bushing. The large shoulder of the bushing faces the outer end of the axle assembly. Install the wheel and the wheel retainer clip on the right side of the axle. Install the drive ball retainer. The cup portion of the retainer should slide over and mate with the overload clutch gear. Install the spring. Install the next retainer. Install the bushing with the washer section toward the center of the axle assembly. Install the bushing with the large shoulder toward the outer edge of the axle. Install the wheel and install the wheel retainer clip. It is important that when you install the wheels, you have the spokes facing the outside of the axle assembly. The assembled components should be arranged as shown if you are working on an axle assembly. When installing the axle assembly into the transmission, it is important that the bushings on either end of the axle made up with the bosses at the outside edges of the transmission. The bushings on the axle assembly must fit inside the bosses located on the transmission case in this area. Also, the bushings are tapered. The narrow portion should face the top of the transmission on both sides. To install, insert the left side bushing partially into the well. Compress the bushing against the spring to allow it to clear the boss on the transmission case and snap into position. Install or rotate each axle clamp down. The axle clamp should rest over the bushings and should be positioned as shown. 
torque the axle clamp screws to 18 to 24 inch pounds. To install the neutral drive pedal assembly, depress the pedal on the drive side. Install the bracket lever assembly onto the neutral drive pedal and insert the pedal assembly into the back of the transmission. Install the neutral drive pedal assembly mounting screw. Torque this screw to 12 to 16 inch pounds. To install the transmission into the base sub-assembly, raise the actuator rod Insert the transmission from the bottom of the base sub-assembly, and as you insert the transmission into the base casting, install the primary drive belt onto the transmission gear and on the motor sprocket gear. Line up the linkage on the transmission with the handle pivot assembly. They must lock together. The transmission linkage and the handle pivot assembly should line up as shown. Install the transmission to base mounting screws and torque the screws to 22 to 26 inch pounds. Install the front center screw first. To install the foot pedal, raise the actuator rod up, slide the foot pedal on and carefully depress the foot pedal on the clamps at the top of the transmission. Install the cover shell to the base sub assembly. Slide it on as shown. Install the rear cover shell screws at either side of the foot pedal and torque the screws to 12 to 16 inch pounds. Install the front cover shell screws and torque these screws to 26 to 30 inch pounds. Install the scuff plate. Gently push forward and down to engage the front tabs of the scuff plate. To lock the rear of the scuff plate on, press down, right at the slot. Install the scuff plate screw just above the neutral drive pedal assembly. Torque this screw to 15 to 19 inch pounds. Install the power cord into the power switch. Engage the tab at the bottom of the cord cover in the opening of the base assembly. Rotate the cover upward and engage the grommet in the opening of the cord cover. Push the cord cover towards the front of the unit to engage this tab into the base opening. Install the cord cover mounting screw and torque this screw to 10 to 20 inch pounds. Install the cord clip to the cover shell reattach based on design of the strain relief. Torque the screw to 7 to 11 inch pounds. When assembled, the cord should be routed as shown and away from the rear wheels. Now, install the handle fork and bag into the handle clip before installing the mini emptor. Always apply gasket lubricant to the surface of the horn gasket. Kirby Engineering recommends that you install the correct part for each specific model.